So uh, first of all, thanks all for coming. This is a very unique opportunity, <laughs> yeah, as you can see. Uh, um, uh, this is my end of the third year uh, after I came to Australia, so I really don't know much about Australian uh, geography or whatever. So this venue and also the last one, um, the National Bridge and also Byron Bay uh, Hotel is all selected and recommended by Bruno and uh, Olivia. And uh, I just sort of organized, you know, organizational issues. Uh, so I want to thank you guys for picking this, you know, really nice place. And uh, the, I just want to uh, uh, briefly introduce what we are going to talk over the next uh, uh, today and tomorrow. And uh, initially, I expected that there will be no um, projector available for today. So. I didn't bring much of the, I didn't prepare anything actually, but this is something I did for my lab meeting several, you know, six months ago or so. So it's not really updated, but I think it's still useful. Um, so, <coughs> someone has something thin, like a booklet or something? I didn't mean to say that Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, what we are going to talk about is uh, so-called panpsychism, but the uh, definition of panpsychism is actually quite tricky, and uh, um, when, when we asked, the reason why we came up to this uh, kind of workshop is that uh, initially I and Christoph and Julio were talking about, you know, proposing symposia for SSC on panpsychism, because there are some kind of, you know, recent uh, research and uh, interest in you know, how to think about panpsychism and things like that, but uh, both Julia and Crystal thought uh, it's not going to be a simple topic and uh, it's not going to be you know, absorbed within 90 minutes of SSC. So we decided to extend it into you know, one half day. And uh, uh, <coughs> briefly speaking, um, I think uh, thinking about uh, panpsychism can force us to think about uh, several issues that recent consciousness researcher started to think, like when does it start, uh, you know, the consciousness, when does it start, like from conception of fetus or baby, it's a question of the continuity of consciousness in the developmental sense, and uh, when does it start phylogenetically, you know, human we know, but uh, monkey, dog, mouse, then fly, bees, you know, bees are the ones that uh, Srini is going to talk about tomorrow morning. And also, uh, <laughs> Monica is going to talk about, you know, possibility of plants consciousness. And uh, uh, in the ASSC, we talked quite a bit about uh, the altered state of consciousness, like sleep, uh, anesthesia, and uh, vegetative consciousness, and so on. So these are sort of standard uh, axes, uh, uh, even your scientists, uh, you know, think about you know, le the level of the difference, a level of consciousness in sleep, death, you know, and also uh, development and uh, evolution, phylogenetic, um, you know, relationship. But um, there are also uh, issues about what is a minimum uh, minimal brain system that uh, can that may be sufficient to uh, sustain <laughs> consciousness. And also, if you start to repress some parts of the brain, maybe you can retain consciousness, but how far can we go? Uh, if we you know, start from repressing the parts of the brain, maybe it doesn't affect chorea or a level of consciousness, but if you completely repress it like a robot, which is what yes, so, uh, you know, is going to talk about tomorrow, is it still possible to think about you know, consciousness? Do, do, uh, does it feel like anything if you become a robot? and also internet. And uh, <coughs> if you start adopting this view, panpsychism, where uh, you know, may, uh, even sim uh, very sim uh, small and uh, simple entity can have a little bit of uh, consciousness, then uh, you have to also ask uh, so-called macro and micro uh, program of, of panpsychism. If you go down to the you know, smaller system, like the parts of you, yourself, like cerebellum, is it possible that cerebellum itself is conscious or not? And liver, 
or cells or atoms, how far down you know, can we go? And if there is any theory that says only one level but not the other, what's the reason you know, why there is consciousness in some level but not the other? We have to think about it seriously. And also, this uh, macro uh, direction of panpsychism program is this society, where when you are engaging in par uh, conversation, is it possible to have consciousness between the two people or not? And if you are engaged in this kind of social conversation, is it possible that there is something arising from this group? And that goes to even our or universe. So what is panpsychism? Um, according to uh, philosopher um, Scrivina, it, uh, it is a meta-theoretical framework and assumes uh, consciousness is a fundamental aspect of the universe. And uh, there are many variants of uh, panpsychism. So it's not really, uh, probably you will have completely different idea about what panpsychism is. And I think it's valid actually. And, but, uh, if you, if you, pretty much all the panpsychistic uh, view admit that organisms, large or small, or complex or simple, uh, can be conscious to variable degrees, and consciousness of a higher organism being more sophisticated. Um, conscious being. And yeah, so uh, there is one common sort of belief across this panpsychistic view that consciousness cannot emerge from nothing. The opposing view is that uh, when some uh, very you know, primitive, non-conscious entity aggregates to some extent and forms a uh, certain complexity, suddenly consciousness appears. And I think this is many of uh, the default view in neuroscientists, I'm sure. But we'll see how, how you think about it. And a uh, uh, little bit of uh, sort of uh, clarification, maybe, uh, David is going to talk about it, but uh, there are s several related but distinct concepts like animism, philozoism, pantheism, panethism, and pan-experientialism. I won't go into the detail, but uh, if you are interested, uh, this uh, David Scrubina's review is uh, pretty good in summarizing what's the difference uh, between these things. But basically, you know, uh, I, I want to be clear that we are interested in the phenomenology of consciousness, but not other stuff like life or uh, yeah, uh, ex, uh, God or something like that. This in pan and in pan and theism, like you know, God penetrates uh, penetrates everything. This is irrelevant for our discussion. So <clears throat> I'll skip this. Just a. Uh, as a sort of introductory remark, I want to go a little bit of uh, history of panpsychism according to Scribina. Um, it seems like in the history that the panpsychism is sort of the default view uh, in a really early history. And Plato and Aristotle has uh, several remarks that you know, they admit the panpsychistic view of the consciousness. But then it became very, you know, uh, pretty much opposed after Aristotelian uh, Christianity era in you know, Western world, where they uh, you know, suggest that the only human is conscious and no other animals are conscious, and they don't feel pain or whatever. It's a kind of crazy view from my side, but you know, that's pretty dominant. And it's still dominant in the uh, Western world, I think. And then uh, during the Renaissance, Leibniz and uh, Spinoza and the other uh, uh, pretty influential psychologists, including uh, James and Pekina, Wundt, uh, Wundt. they uh, made some remark about panpsychism, actually. If you think about phenomenology, if you take the phenomenology really seriously, in a sense, it's an, uh, I guess, you know, necessary con consequence, I guess. But in any case, then after that, uh, uh, so because of the success of the physics, uh, positivism and the concept of emergence, it became again uh, unpopular, but that's really recent from this in a really overview of the history. And then uh, recently it became again kind of becoming popular among philosophy and with uh, Julio's uh, IIT, even neuroscientists or psychologists like me uh, started to think about serious. All right. Um, okay, then I'll skip. That's the sort of really rough 
uh, history of panpsychism. And the uh, current view, uh, default view on panpsychism, clearly stated by John Sarr, is that it's uh, breathtakingly implausible and there is not the se slightest reason to adopt panpsychism. But that's probably true for most of the philosophers, you know, view. <clears throat> okay. I guess I'll skip this. And then I, I'll go briefly about uh, several issues um, I think uh, needs to be discussed at the workshop. One is uh, continuity of consciousness, you know, where consciousness starts from, you know, phylogenetical sense, developmental sense, so macro micro sense. And so unit of consciousness, uh, that's sometimes called a uh, combination problem, but uh, even, I guess, I, I, I'll explain a little bit uh, more about this. And then the third one is a non-conscious processing. I, as you, well, most of you are in uh, you know, ASSC, we know that, that there are lots of brain processes, neural, neural activity that does not generate qualia. And how, how this, you know, panpsychistic view, you know, incorporate or be consistent with this kind of thing. Um, if everything is conscious, why, why there is such a thing like you know, non-conscious processing? And then, uh, fourth one is qualia. If there is a theory that tries to explain, you know, many, you know, entity can experience something, then it has to also have some uh, experimental power that, what, what exactly that entity is experiencing. I, in, in my, you know, uh, head, uh, I always have this IIT in my mind, but uh, any other theory should be okay in principle, but, you know, this theory has to uh, you know, account what exact experience plants are experiencing, or photodiodes are experiencing, or, you know, uh, liver is experiencing. And then the uh, final really almost impossible question is how to test any of the panpsychistic theories empirically. It's a very difficult question. And uh, to, for the interest of time, and uh, I want, to, uh, I want you to think about this uh, really weird uh, example. Um, if you think, uh, like me, that uh, for, to, for the phenomenology to arise from the brain, all you need is this connectivity pattern or mechanism for each neuron to interact with each other, and some particular kind of activation pattern is present, then that should translate to some particular, you know, uh, conscious states, then uh, as a consequence, we, sh we should be able to think about something extremely simple and uh, yet very counterintuitive. And that's probably, you know, not, uh, that, that's something interesting to think about. You know, uh, philosophers have uh, thought about this uh, thought experiment of brain in the vet, right? Uh, if you disconnect the brain and then leave it, you know, alive, whether it, there is any, you know, experience in that brain. I think it's, in a sense, trivial, but uh, we can think more, you know, extreme thing. For example, if you adopt I IIT, then we should be able to create a box that doesn't have any input into it, and that doesn't do anything, you know, no output, and there is no history of learning for this box, you know, to learn from input to output. But we should be able to figure out some kind of anatomical connectivity inside the box, so that that box itself will continue to stay in certain state. There is no dynamics, but that state of that box corresponds to uh, the box is feeling in pain. And it continues to um, feel in the pain, you know, unless there is any, uh, any kind of perturbation to that state. I don't know whether it makes sense or not, but uh, this kind of thing should be possible uh, if you adopt the IIT kind of view. Anyway, um, uh, so I, I, I said that I, sh I would make a little bit clear about the second one, right? Maybe that's fine. Okay. So uh, uh, to summarize uh, as of this uh, introduction, uh, 
why do we need to consider the possibility of panpsychism now? So the first one is that uh, this kind of view uh, may suggest new approaches to consciousness and mind-matter interaction. And the secondary, uh, it may propose sharp relief to uh, implicit assumptions of both emergentism and the traditional mechanistic philosophy and offers fundamental challenge to both. And the third one is the potentially important pragmatic and ethical consequences and uh, for, uh, uh, philosophically it's least uh, analyzed uh, positions in the philosophy. <coughs> so that's the conclusion from uh, uh, Skurbina's uh, paper. Okay, so uh, that's it for my introduction, and uh, uh, the format of this uh, symposium as a whole is uh, for each speaker to uh, present uh, their view on like uh, 20 minutes, uh, providing some evidence uh, to suggest you know, some uh, primitive uh, uh, mechanism like in plants or bees or uh, robots can be conscious, and also uh, uh, to present some theory like IoT. To consider how to consider this panpsychism view. And the uh, next speaker is David. But if there is any question about my introduction, fine. So, okay, David. And I, I have to say that 